Hello. Are you doing all right? Good, good, good. Um, are you? Welcome to the final leg of the Red Bull Music Academy UK tour. We're finishing things off in Manchester at the Albert Hall. Before me, I have a man who's had, he's had a pretty good career, but the last year has been fairly remarkable. I think we'll all agree. Um, he's had three massive hits. He's appeared on stage with Kanye West. He has worked with everybody from Rat King to ASAP Mob to his own brother and long-term collaborator, JME. Some people know him as Joseph Jr. Adenuga. Please welcome Skepta. Yo. Thanks, everybody, for coming today. This is quite sick still. It's quite um, a But Hattie didn't get an introduction. Oh. Can, we, can we get a round of applause for Hattie? Thanks. This is Hattie Collins. She's dedicated her life to the whole culture, to the whole style, all the whole sounds, everything. She's dedicated her life to it. And I hope that by the end of this, we can get some kind of um, award for you for being, for dedicating wow. her life to this, to this shit. Thank you. She deserves well, it. Hattie Collins, remember that name. Thank you. I've dedicated my life to that and like TV. ER, Game of Thrones, you name it, I watch it. Um, so how are you? How are you feeling? Welcome to Manchester. You've been here before, I'm sure. This is second home. Yeah. Oh, yeah. second home? How come? Manchester's sick, man. <laughs> I like Manchester because um, I can't remember exactly what year it was, but I was up here for a while with uh, President T and a couple of youths on the road. And... Um, yeah, I was up here on my stupid shit, just doing like stupid shit that I couldn't, I, I won't even say it again. Like, it's just kiddie shit. But when I was on the streets out here, that's where I just learned all the style. Like, I used to come up here in like um, Air Force Ones and that. And they used to be like, yo, what you, why are you wearing them fucking, what do you say, you for bucking Yankee craps? <laughs> yeah. Yankee trainers, blood. And they made me they they made me just switch up that whole shit and then like get into like shocks, like into shocks, into like black windbreakers and like the whole style that I've adopted like in the past couple of years is definitely based on like Manchester, Liverpool style. Interesting. So do you style. feel that they that they are much more true to the sort of British sense of style than we are in people are in London? Yeah, I think like London like London have for a long time they've always like gravitated towards like Americans. Whereas, like, up north, I think they're just, like, it's just, like, it's just greasy up here, isn't it? Like, there's not, like, there isn't, yeah, like, in London, like, you can go to, like, cool, like, just do, like, loads of exciting things for, like, rap and, like, whatever, any, any kind of entertainment. But in, like, up north, like, this is the grease. Like, guys are really out here trying to get this money. So the dress, you know, the dress code is, like, get this money dress code. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> What is a get this money dress code? It's exactly what I explained, man. It's just all black, just windbreakers, tracksuits, like, you get me straight grease, like, hats down low, like, curved peaks, so one can't see, man, you get me? Like, the whole style that I've adopted, that's why, like, I had to check back for, like, I had to really check back for Manchester, like, spiritually, not just looking at pictures and, like, thing, like, really talking to my old brethren that I used to roll with up here, just, just gauging where their vibes are in their head and stuff like that, and, like, really, the lifestyle more than just like just trying to fucking just do it. You get what I'm saying? It's hard as well because the media, and I speak as a member of that media, ugh, which sounds a bit disgusting, but you know, it, you do tend to concentrate on people in London and the focus tends to be on people from London and, and, and people are forced almost to move down to places like London or New York or LA. If you're, if you're not from a capital city, then you tend to have to gravitate. That's not too fair, I guess, if you're... I mean, would you like to see that shift, like that power that kind of London, places like London have? Would you like to see that spread a bit more, like a bit more democracy? Yeah, I, I've never really liked that. Like, I've never really liked that. There's like a trickle down. It starts in America, kind of goes to some other places, London, Paris and stuff. And then like everyone else is like, fuck that. Like, I don't, I don't, I know, I've never really liked that. Even like me, like adopting the dress code or clashing devil man from Birmingham or whatever, it's always no matter what it seems to other people, but it's always to spread the vibe. You get what I'm saying? Like, I could have clashed anyone on Lord of the Mics, but I clashed Devilman because I want Birmingham accents 
to be recognized like in music you know what i'm saying i want it, i want i want all the accents to come through in music and i want everybody to always i've always wanted people to be on the same level playing field like that's what i've always wanted and i guess so continuing on with that do you think there's a little bit behind the interest that grime is generating at the moment from american artists we'll get onto it a little bit more later but is there anything to do with that with like people like Kanye and Drake being like, actually, yeah, there's, there's these people in London, there's people around the world that actually we need to hear their voices as much as we need to hear our own? Um, I, I can't say, I don't know their incentives or their motives and stuff like that, but like for me personally, I just like, especially traveling, like this job allows me to travel and I get to go to so many different cities and see so many different like people from the hood and like that are going through things in their own area that I relate to, you get what I'm saying? And I'm like, just because I'm from London or whatever, like, why is it, like, why can't their music be heard as well? Like, I wanna listen to their music, I wanna do songs with them, I wanna do, like, I just wanna put, like, England. Like, when I go around the world, like, so I really feel like they don't know that we have hoods here. They have no idea. Yeah, no, I don't think they, I don't think they have, and it's like, I'm not trying to show that this is a greasy place, but we have, you know what I'm saying? We've got all ends of the spectrum, just like everywhere else. So, yeah, I just, that's just, I, I'm, it's like autopilot for me now. I don't, I don't like strategically go and be like, oh yeah, I'm gonna get like, it's just me, I just live my life and I'll just meet people and I just love to, to spread energies, man, good energies. Are you, are there, are there artists from outside of London that you're particularly into at the moment? Anyone from Birmingham or Manchester that you could care to name that you're, you think are doing, making good music? Um, I've always felt Trigger from Manchester, Shadow D, man. I just think his style is just so sick, man. man it's this, I don't know, man. It's just like the epitome of like Manchester gangster. Yeah, yeah. Um, Birmingham, like just, just, just like what everyone's like, what everyone's listening to. I, I, I think it's safe to say Birmingham is on the map now. Like, so I don't need to like say who. Like, everyone knows who we're listening to in Birmingham. Like, they're they're straight on the map right now. So, yeah, I just listen to. I, I don't know what I listen to. I know it's hard to tell, but you are in theory jet lagged right now, right? I don't know if anyone can tell. I just look, you don't look too jet lagged to me. But you've just got back from where? You just got back from LA? Yeah. Could you tell us what you've been doing in LA? Please? Um. <laughs> it's like the ghost from beyond. Ooh. Yeah, I've just been doing studio sessions, man, with loads of different people. So, because. Uh, you can go on the internet now and look at stuff, right? <laughs> <laughs> I've been on Instagram and I've been on your, I've been on your Twitter. I mean, it feels like something interesting was maybe happening out in there, out in, out in LA. Can you tell us a little bit about who you were working with in LA specifically? Um, I was, I was working with loads of people. I was mm. working with many people. <laughs> now yeah, I'm playing. Yeah. I was, I was working with. Um, there's an up and coming rapper called Playboy Carty from Atlanta. Did um, a session with him. Um, I was working on some stuff with Kanye. I was working on some stuff with Earl Sweatshirt. Um, and yeah, I literally, I was either like just in the studio at Red Bull. Thank you, Red Bull, for always supporting and looking after me wherever I go. But yeah, um, I was in a Red Bull studio or I was at um, Earl's studio. That's what I was just doing when I was there, like literally. So were you making stuff for your album or their album or just to see what was gonna happen? Yeah, like I think like my whole like, how can I say it? My whole ethos for making music in the past couple years is all about making music like as natural as I can. I fucking hate email music. Like you send me your verse and like I'm gonna do mine here and shit like that. Like nowadays, like you can hear it. You know what I'm saying? When you hear a song and you know, rah, like you two weren't in the studio together. Like who's getting money here? You know what I'm saying? Like which one of you are getting paid here? Like, and I don't really like that. I, I think I think that I think that whole sh I think that's just played out in general. So I was just out there. Just in studio. I'm not when we're making tunes. I'm not like, yo, wait, oh, whose album is this going on? Like, no, like I don't. It's we're just we're just vibes. And some days nothing gets made. Some days we just fucking crack joke for the whole day, and forget that we've not made anything, or whatever. Some days we just make beats or just write like whatever. So I'm just like, I'm gonna be back out there. And this is I've just found this new way to work. I kind of I kind of never expect to finish um, a song in a day, and be like, yo, this is for my thing, yeah. No, I don't like, nah. I was just out there just working and then whatever happens, I really want Earl Sweatshirt on my album now because I feel like over time I've been putting in work for this whole like wave and I thought of this wave to start it. And I feel like certain people on the back end are getting 
credit for, you know, finding me or whatever. And it was really like going on radio with like Rat King, um, No Wave Radio, all the legends at Supreme that was showing me love in the early days. Like they just came to me and was like, yo, we want you to start fucking doing shows or just, just showing love, you get me? All them people there, like those are the people that really like helped me, you get me? Like, I don't really, so I just need, I need Earl on the album, but then anything else is just whatever. I just like can go on anyone's album and it can come out whenever it's ready. Yeah, yeah. So how did that actually start then? Because it, I remember, so a couple of years ago we were in New York and we were doing some talk or something and you were off you were off working with various people. You, Dev Hines came to your show and all, this, all these different relationships seem to be emerging. H how did that actually happen? Because I think what people are sensing is a sense of authenticity from it. It's not like you guys have just, like you just said, it's not like you email each other or DM each other and hooking up to work. You're actually creating friendships first and foremost. Is that right? And, and then, so how did you do that? Yeah, I think like now that it, with the internet, like I don't think anybody's got a reason to complain anymore. Like, if you make something, you know, like the internet's there for you. Like, it's like just do whatever you want on it, and that's what I did really. At one stage, when I felt like the music scene in the UK was going a certain direction, I wasn't. I just wasn't happy with what was going on. Like, I wasn't happy with the way I was making music. I wasn't happy with the music that was coming out. Nothing. So, I kind of like, I kind of like took a risk to go, like, back to square one took a risk for people to say, yo, Skepta's fallen off, or Skepta's like, he's weird, or like, I got called a hipster the other day. Like, you have a beard, though. The fuck's that? Like, you, have to have a, you have to have, like, brogues and a beard, don't you? I don't know. Like, how am I a hipster? I don't understand that. Like, I, get, I, I took a risk to be called all these names because I've been, I've been at square one before in life. You get what I'm saying? Like, I always know, like, I'm a man and I can... I can come back from anything, you know? So it was like, I just wanted to, it's from the beginning of Blacklisted. I think that, it, that, that was, can I tell a quick story? You certainly can. Yeah, so we went on tour. Um, we were, I can't remember what tour it was, but we were on tour at one time, Crept and Conan were with me, and we got to Leicester. And um, Charlie, he pointed at, he pointed at like a, a music shop, yeah? And he was like, yo, like, that's where I get all my music equipment from. And something happened in my, in my mind. I remember someone saying to me one time, like, a carpenter isn't a carpenter if he doesn't have tools. He could tell everyone he's a carpenter, but if you ain't got tools, how are you a carpenter? Skepta, you are a musician. Why do you not have a studio? Like, why don't you have a studio? You should have a studio. So I was like, you know what? I'm gonna buy a studio and put on a bus. Like, I'm gonna do, I'm gonna, I'm, this might sound like American rappery, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna put my studio on the bus and like, just do what we're doing. And that's when we made um, Tour Bus Massacre. Me, Crept and Conan, we made Tour Bus Massacre on the bus. And then when we got back to London, uh, I remember I'll come back and I was like, I can't be bothered to take these, like, all this equipment home. I'm just gonna leave it on the bus and just go home, man. <laughs> when the taxi turned up, I said, oh, fuck it, man. Like, just use all my strength I had, yeah. I just put all the stuff back in, 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 in a taxi. And I took it home, and for the first time, I was able to like wake up at four in the morning with a thought and just hit the computer. Like really free, like doing my thing. Like doing my thing, like. And it was like, shit. All of a sudden, Blacklisted came out. Like Blacklisted was made, it was just made so naturally, like sleeping in the studio on the floor, like waking up, just doing little bits and bobs like here and there. And Blacklisted was made, and when I made it, for me, like, Konnichiwa is gonna be great, yeah. But Blacklisted for me was like my, was like my realization CD. Every time I listen to it, I'm always gonna hear myself. I like that that happened to you, Skepta. You know them ones that, I like that you thought that. I like that you came to that realization one day that you, this shit ain't right. And it was from then, I started to make music really freely. And then it was when I made Lay Her Down, and I said Dev's name in it. He contacted me and said, boom, 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 let's make a tune. And like, that was probably the first, that for me, that was the first like relationship that I had like with another artist from far away. And it was, and then because of how organically it happened, I was like, yeah, I'm just gonna do all my music like this. And it's like, I can make a song with anyone, but I just don't feel it, man. I don't feel it again. Like, I'm a big man, like, I don't, I, like all that stuff, 
is like, it's bullshit. You know what I'm saying? Like, all that stuff's bullshit. I want to know, like, do I fuck with you? Like, I'm, I, 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 before I'm a fan of you, I'm a man. So are you a man? You get what I'm saying? Are you a man? Or are you coming here to try and finesse? You get what I'm saying? Are you coming here to try and finesse man again? Are you coming here to big me up so every radio station I get called on, Mr. Jam wants to talk to me about Drake and Kanye? You want, so this is like free radio promo for these guys. You get what I'm saying? Like, so I've just clocked, I've just clocked that and now I'm, I just move in a way and I know that not to make it about American rappers, around the world, they can feel this energy from me. They can feel the first time like a man, you get what I'm saying? Like a man that stands for his thing and he's doing his music, whether anyone likes it or not, he's just doing his thing. And that's why they fuck with me. It doesn't matter about my music. Like, it ain't safe, that's not me. And they're not great, so much greater than anything I've made before, but it's just like my ethos and how I've been moving, like, and how I speak to them. And when they see me, who they see, you get what I'm saying? They see someone that they're like, yeah, this guy is a soldier in my army, you get me? You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah, I fuck with him. And since then, that's what's been moving. I don't care about no one. I don't give a shit about who's sold what. If I like you as a person, we're gonna make some music together. It doesn't have to be the first day we meet each other. I don't wanna make a tune. I'll be meeting rappers. I don't wanna ask them for nothing. Not a drink, not fucking Rizla, nothing. <laughs> you get me? So that's, that's what it is now. And I think, like, I think that's the whole, like, every, everybody should just move like that, man. Everybody should move like that. Like, I, I understand, like, we've grown up watching certain people's films and, like, listening to their music all our lives, and we almost, like, aspire to, like, aspire to be, like, you go to America and you've got an American SIM card. Oh, where's Hattie? Oh, she's in America, you know? What's her number? Plus one. Oh, she's made it. Like, <laughs> oh, she's out. You get me? That's how, like, we all, English people almost, that's, let's not lie. You get what I'm saying? It's just like the American dream. That ain't for man, like. We are here, and the moment I realize that, yeah, I just walk with an integrity that's just, like, untouchable. So, it's time to create, it's time to create the British dream, or you are now creating the British dream. I like that. I just thought that on the spot. I like that, Thanks. yeah, yeah. We need to make the British dream. And I hope that I stay alive long enough for people to see me do it, because I'm gonna do it. Like, I'm not, like the team that I've got around me now, I've surrounded myself with people that are so fucking legendary. I can't ask for a better team because it's like, before, I'd be with people that are trying to earn 20% off me. So when everybody that's giving you advice is trying to earn the 20% off you, you're walking in a money direction. But now, I'm with people that just want to do this thing, really want to put this whole sound and style on the map. So I'll be like, yo, I want to do this. There's no I'm in an R. And man, I'm like, yeah, we're going to make this work. Like, we're going to make this work. It's not, oh, no, nah, Skip, I don't think, no. I want this to happen. Like, I want this to happen, and it's going to happen. And that's... That's how I'm moving now. It might come across as fucking chauvinistic or whatever, but I'm doing me with my team and all my team's doing them as well. And we're gonna bust down the door and make this British dream solidified. That is a little round of applause. Maybe, I don't know. I feel like, yeah. Well, you, you just said the word chauvinistic, but you've actually got lots, you've got women on your team. So, you know, you're not, I don't think you're chauvinistic. <laughs> But also I think it's important to point out, as long as I've known you over the years, is that it's always the same people around you, which I really, really like. Whenever I see you, you know, Shorty's there, Max Wim's there, Aaron's there, like it's all, it's all the same faces. And of course people, new members come in and out, but it feels to me that you've created a, I don't know, I guess loyalty's quite important to you, like a sense of family around you. I don't know if that's, if that's right, but. Yeah. Family. Yeah. Yeah. Just people that I can like, that I can trust, you know what I'm saying? I don't like people that like, are for the industry system. So I could meet someone and I'll be like, trying to work them out or whatever. Like my manager took me to dinner to go and meet this, uh, our, press, our press guy. And I wasn't talking to him for the whole dinner. Like I was looking at him like from under the brim of my hat thinking, you, what are you doing there? Like, what are you doing here? I'll just be meeting people and that's fully checking them out. Like, what is your motive? You know what I'm saying? Because I just want it to be a family, man. I believe that, you know, everything's perception. All these record labels are what they are because of what we know about them. You know what I'm saying? Um, the accolades that they have are accolades that we gave them. So it might take time, but I know at one stage that uh, whatever we make and whatever, uh, whatever brand that we push is going to become you know, 
same level as everything, as long as we believe in it as much as they believe in their one, you know? And like family, the whole family understanding that is the most important thing to me. You know what I'm saying? Sometimes I'll be like at home with all the man, and I'll just, I'll just be pacing the house, like shouting, like shouting shit. Like, yo, we're gonna do this thing. Like, you man, don't. I'll be getting the man, then we're just like, oh, fuck it, all. Like, skeptics going off again, but I don't care. Like, I don't care, bro. I'll talk until my mouth is dry, fam. Like, I, I, I just, like, because I remember a time when I didn't believe, man. It's a weird, it's a bad place, you know? It's like, it's, it's a fucked up place, man. And, 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 and I want all my brethren to have the confidence that I have now. I want them to think like me. I want them to fucking, like, walk around and be them selves because when you are yourself it's the most fucking like unique piece of art ever you get what i'm saying like when you're looking at something else and you're trying to be like that that's just like you're not like bro you're born fucking sick you're born like this is fucking sick you get me and i want all my bridges to understand that like we as a people we are sick we've we've done something in the last i don't know how many years it's, it's been like man's done some serious things you get me and like, it's easy for this country to play it down. Like, nah, you didn't get, you didn't chart, so that was whack. Right. Nah, that wasn't on a playlist, so that was whack. Like, but we judge our like, we judge our success of different things now. You get what I'm saying? We set goals. We say we want to do that. How are we gonna get there? Let's go towards that. Anything that pops in on the side, yeah, thanks, thanks, bro, respect. But not now, because we're going here. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? We're going right there. We get the goal done. We go and check if my man's still on his thing, he's not on it, all right, respect. We're gonna go to a next thing, you get what I'm saying? And it's just, and, and believing, believing, making your thoughts materialize, like making them come to life. Like I think stuff, I say, bare stuff that's happened, you can ask my team, like, bare stuff that's happened, I said that it's gonna happen. And I said that people were gonna think this way about it. You get what I'm saying? That's how we planned it. We knew that these people were gonna, some people were gonna diss, some people were gonna say, nah, Skepta's not right, or he's doing this. Yeah, we, you, you, have to, you have to understand that to, 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 to be an individual, not everyone's gonna agree with you. And those are not the people that we're listening to. When we're doing our thing and we're believing ourselves, we're listening to ourselves and we're listening to people who are like-minded and we're gonna keep going and going and going and going, and that's it. So this time last year, roughly, say like a year ago, what were your goals and have you fulfilled them? Uh, I can't tell you that, cuz. I can't tell you, but we've definitely fulfilled them. Like we said, we've set mad, everything that's happened in the past couple of years. Maybe just one goal, or like one of them you could say? We said we was gonna play Fader South by. That happened? Yeah, we said we was gonna play South by South by. I told my team, I said, this is what we have to do. Like, we're gonna make music and go towards that direction. And we did it. All right, I'm not gonna push you on the other ones. Yeah, no, please don't. I won't. But. Um, I need to talk about Kanye a little bit more because obviously that's it's a point of interest. Um, just tell me the tell me the process from like hanging out in, in New York and meeting Rat King and and Ian Connor and ASAP Barry and all those guys through to Kanye at the Brits. Like how how did that actually happen? Because I think a lot of people will watch that and go, I don't, I don't think I would encourage anybody to try and replicate what you've done. It's pointless. Like you just said, everyone be individual, do your own thing. But how practically? Can people look at something like what you've done and, and be inspired? Like, how did it actually physically happen? Well, it started with the music. Like, you have to have a talent of your own. Like, because I'm sure anybody could probably wind their way around these people somehow. But then when you get there, what are you gonna do? Just take photos and selfies and that. Like, I don't, I don't, I don't care about all that. Like I'm trying You've to meet, I'm trying to meet these guys to show them the talent. You get what I'm saying? I wanna like I'll I'll go around. Kanye don't know what phone I got. He don't know if I got a Nokia, Samsung, iPhone. Cause I've never taken my phone out when I've been next to him. I will go in the studio, open my laptop. I'm on things. Like he's seen how I move. Like I don't care about all that. Like I'm not here and trying to be like in the outside world. If I'm here, I'm here. You get what I'm saying? And that's how and that's how I move around all them guys and they've seen it. Like from the start, it started from like blacklisted when I made Ace Hood Flow. See, that was me saying, like, I've been keeping my ear to the streets, the UK run out of ideas, everybody in cars, America's beat. So I learned, that's what I thought the state of the game was. Like, I was like, this is bullshit, man. This is shit. Like, making, like, covers of everyone else. Even though I was doing covers, I'll do covers before or whatever, but I still had my own music. Some rappers actual whole career is like freestyles on other people's beats or whatever. So I was like, cool, I said that, bits and pieces. 
kept it moving, kept it moving. And then Virgil tweeted about us. Just to say, so Virgil's Kanye's creative director? Mm -hmm. Is that right? Okay. Yeah. Uh, he tweeted about us or whatever. I remember everyone was saying, ah, oh, whatever, man. I'm trying to jump on Grime now, whatever. Trying to be fucking, get on it or whatever. So then he, he posted like a, a blog that he did like years ago of when he was speaking about Jamie, like how innovative he was to make t-shirts. Like and with, his, with his crew name and sell them and how, legend, like how sick that is. Because now everybody does that. You know what I'm saying? But Jamie was mad early on them waves. So he was talking about that. Time went by. Um, Lil Ian came to London. And people was talking to him, talking to him about me. Then we linked up. And I remember when we linked up, like we just linked up. We didn't have no plan to do anything. We was just chilling, we was going to a couple parties. Yeah, we were just chilling for ages, man. And then we, we, we used to just like watch different freestyles. And I was saying to him like, yo, like, I, feel like, I feel like we can bridge the gap between New York and London, not on a musical wave, but like as a people. Because when, because people always, artists always try and like collaborate and think, oh, and you see people on Twitter, they're like, yeah, that's it, like, this is it, it's done, we're fucking, but music is not, if there's not, if it's not on the street in real life, it's not, it doesn't mean anything, you know, and I think that that's what, that's probably what the main thing that we try to do is, we, when, we, when I was going to New York, I ain't trying to go to like no fancy places with like rappers to go and pop bottles and shit like that, like he, Ian would be like, yo, like, go to go and link this guy go and link this guy or whatever. And I'm the same with him when he's here, whatever. Where do you need to go? Do you want to link my man? Yeah, go and do the... So when I went to New York, um, I was going to No Wave Radio. Uh, and it was weird because I was listening to Rat King. Um, what's that song I said? It's a piece of shit, yeah? I used to listen to Piece of Shit all the time. And I went to No Wave and I saw Wiki in the radio station and he was like, yo, Skepta! And I was like, Wiki! And he was like, yo, yo, I'm a big fan. I said, brother, I'm a big fan of you lot as well, fam. Like, he was like, yo, okay, we started freestyling, did a couple of freestyles. They came here and we did a Just Jam together. I think we did a Just Jam, Rat King, and just got to Just Jam. And then, um, and then I put Wiki on the remix of That's Not Me. And then, like, I think from then, people was like, I noticed when I was going to America, like people was like understanding me. They was like, oh yeah, da, 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 da. they get like they get the whole vision. And then Ian introduced me to Bari. Um, this might not go chronologically, right, cause, but I'm trying to think in my head. Um, yeah, introduced me to Bari, and I went, I'm, <laughs> I went to his house. Yeah, I knocked for him. This guy comes down and lets me upstairs. I sit, he's chilling there, and he was like, "Yo, you hungry?" I was like, "Yeah." And then he went and he made me like a bowl of mashed potato, yeah? <laughs> a bowl of mashed potato with some hot sauce on it, yeah? And a glass of lemonade, yeah? And this guy's handed me this and I looked at him and I was like, blood, you're a fucking legend, you know? Like, <laughs> that's some real G shit, like he's never met me before, like. A yeah. man would try and put a bit of broccoli to spice it up or like, <laughs> you get me? Like, if I, that's what I would do, you're trying to eat. Fam, anything on the side, blood, like falafel or hummus. Like, man's giving me mashed potato hot sauce and fucking lemonade. I was like, this guy is a bad man. Like, <laughs> that's for, I'm never gonna forget that. And, I, and from then, like, me and him clicked. Then I came back. I went back to New York. We made, we, we said, oh, let's go to Atlanta. Let's fucking go to Atlanta and just, like, just fuck about. Let's make a song as well to drive there too. And we made it ain't safe to drive to Atlanta. We didn't even end up driving to Atlanta. But like we From made- From New York to drive to Atlanta is quite long. Huh? It's like 12 hours, how long is far? I don't know how far it was, but we was making a tune to drive there. Like, I don't know whether we was gonna stop off and catch things, but yeah, we made it ain't safe to drive to Atlanta. And the, I came back, I, I came home and I see a couple of, couple of his brethren, they was putting it on Vine. Ain't safe, ain't safe, ain't safe. And then like the song started to get big. Then we came and then I said, you know what, fuck this man, you gotta come London, like you gotta come London, we gotta do like a party, we gotta, we gotta like do the video and shit. He came over, we did that. 
And then that was a fucking, still is a mad thing. It ain't safe. Sometimes I'll think about that tune. It's bigger than me. Like, it's, that song is like, it's just, it's just, it was the real bridge. Yeah. It was the real bridge between like New York and London. That was when, especially because everyone was like, oh yeah, Skep, go and do the video to Ain't Safe in New York. And I'm like, nah. That's what every, that's what every English rapper would want to do in it. I was like, nah, I'm bringing Young Lord to my block, Meridian Walk, and making him wear a tracksuit. <laughs> and he had the man bag on, his swag was crazy in it. And like all these brethrens like in New York, they'll be watching it and be like, yo, like, where is that? Like, why is, why is there bad niggas out there? Like, where the, where the fuck were you? Yeah, I'm in London, bro, I'm with Skepta. Yeah, I was scared of the goons, like, they, like the mondem, you know, like, 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 the American, <laughs> like, it's sick when they, because, see, like, they'll be, like, trying to talk like me, yeah. you get what I'm saying, because of how, like, I carry myself, you get what I'm saying, and it's, like, from there, you, the rest of the story, that whole Drake, Kanye story, that happened, and then, yeah, we're here now, that's it. It feels like, Part of what has has attracted people, not just not just as Americans, but like part of the, your success over the last year, is that you have gone back to basics. Like you dug up that old core keyboard that Jamra made, I think VIP Destruction on. Mm. So there was a keyboard that that Skepta thought about, he'd remembered from back in the day, and he made Jamra go and track it down. I can maybe let you tell that story, but that was what um, uh, that's not me was made on. So it kind of you return to the grime sound, but you've also like your fashion has also returned very much to that. Your videos, have, like the whole aesthetic, has gone back to basics. How important do you think that is, and, and why did you do that? Why did you make that choice? Um, I wouldn't say back. I wouldn't say back. I didn't go back. I just like, yeah, I went forward. I went forward like. Uh, I just feel like not the world the world is like really like fucking real now man. You can't like you can't fake it. You can't fake shit no more. Like I did a video I was saying this earlier, I did a video with um uh well so alive back in the day and at the end of the video I jumped off the fucking roof. Man end can't of jump off, off no roof now in no video. Man was saying, What are you guy and your dickhead about your jumping? Like man know that man know you're not dead, bro. Like like you just come to the show and just done a show, you get me? And and it's like them can't just that's that's banner, but like just on that wave, like people ain't stupid no more. Exactly what I said about emo music. Like you hear a song and you know these two guys ain't fucking with each other, bruv, man. Like, come on, loud that tune, bruv. Like, forget that song, bruv. You're wasting time. And like I just really I just wanted to get real, man. I wanted to be me. I want it to be me. I, f I feel like a lot of rappers like to go to rap, to go to music, they've got to do this thing. Like they've got to like soup themselves up to, 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 to rap. And I don't, I never want it to be that. I just want to be like Skepta, like just me. And whenever I'm making videos or I'm making music or whatever, I just really try and make it as me as possible because I've got to perform this stuff on stage, man. It's one of the shittest feelings when you're on stage doing a tune that you don't like. like you don't even fuck with this tune no more, it's bullshit, you get what I'm saying? Like, that feeling is not nice, so I just made a point from Blacklisted, and it, I did straight up, I did the straight up remix in between there somewhere as well. Um, so that was before That's Not Me. I, 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 I don't know, I just had the whole, it, it, it's, 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 how can I say it? It's every day it gets more advanced, this idea. It's, I'm freestyling it, but the basis is, stay fucking true as possible. And then loads of things keep coming out. Somehow I end up in Sports Direct because I want to be true as possible. You get what I'm saying? Somehow I make the That's Not Me video because I want to be as true as possible. This is the basis, you get what I'm saying? And all beautiful things are going to be happening out, of, happening out of that, but that's, that is the ethos. Because you're reflecting really what's going on in the world, I feel like. It feels like every, no, who needs to hear about how much money someone's got how many women they've banged, how wonderful life is when, you know, life, life is a bit hard at the moment and obviously everyone wants to party and have fun and let loose, which you can do to those tracks, but I guess, like I said, yeah, you're not going back, that was, that was not the right way to put it, but you're, you're going forward, but you're reflecting very much the mood and the atmosphere of the times. The realness, like, 
the realness of today. The world is very real. Like you could just go on the internet and curate your whole lifestyle from the net. If you don't wanna, if you wanna know about what food you're eating, you can go and check it out now. If you wanna like dress a certain way, you can go on the internet and you can find all the right things and places to shop. Like you can do you now. And that's why everyone's really, it's kind of weird because on the flip side, everyone's become really like, you get what I'm saying? Recluse on my own. I'm good with my iPhone or my Samsung and my Twitter and my Instagram. But it's just the individuality that's happening now is just it's sick, man. I love it. How people are just themselves now. Like it's not fake anymore. Like you just straight yourself. Being everything that makes you different to the next person is somehow turned out to be good now. Yeah. You get what I'm saying? Like yeah, everyone used to want to blend in and not, yeah. not stand out. Like guys really want to be different now. Like they like everybody like they're like yeah of course I've got like f three big toes you get what I'm saying like that's man you get what I'm saying like they'll be like yo come on free toe gang like man are promoting man are promoting the weirdest shit because they know bro this is what makes me me this is what makes me me this is the most fucking I'm the most unique creation like on the planet. You get what I'm saying? So, and like, yeah, that's the, that's the ethos, man, really. Have you got three toes? Three big toes? No. Okay, just checking. What do you think then about, um, about Grime in 2015? Um, I wrote a piece about a year and a half ago where I got so slewed for, but I felt like I was right. Yeah. Okay, like you said earlier, I follow Grime for a long time, yeah. since, you know, 2003, whatever, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Been a big fan. And after around, I'd say 2010 to 2013, 14, I just, I just wasn't hearing anything that I liked. So I don't think that grime died at all. I don't say that. I know that grime was still happening. I know it was still, it was still being made. It, people were still doing tunes. But from like 2014, this new energy came through, this new excitement. There was hits again. But there must be a reason why the media is now, is now looking at grime. Yeah, they're I'm looking at it because the people that are making it are not caring again. That's why they have to look at it. They can't ignore it. Like, the, what are you going to do? Are you going to play like we don't exist? Like, we're killing it, like, worldwide. Like, they can see what's happening. So that's why they have to do it. I feel like at one stage when gigs came out, there was, like, everyone wanted to be a road rapper for a second. You know what I'm saying? I think, like, you really changed the mood of, like, UK. Um, everyone... Yeah, like, his, his entry into the game was, like, fucking unforgettable, man. Like, that was a barrage. That was, like, every... It was a lifestyle, like, putting out mixtapes with raps on it and shit like that. You get what I'm saying? And he switched it up a little bit, and it kind of went different. But the thing I like about gigs is, like, some people call him a grime artist. Gigs? Yeah. Okay, like, what? Like, I've seen on my Twitter, someone will say, I'm oh, my top three grime... MCs are skept are gigs and like Dizzy Rascal or something like that because he because the way he moves he's just like a like he's like a he's like a that's like a UK MC you know what I'm saying and I, and whether he calls himself a rapper or not like he really blurred he was one of the guys who blurred the line you know what I'm saying like he 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 would jump on a tune with JME then he's on a tune with Skepta then he's on a tune with like another rapper or whatever like so I think he played a good part. I think he played a good part in it, and it, um, it changed. But yeah, you know, now everyone, this isn't to do with the music, man. I, I like I, this is gonna sound fucked up, but I don't really think that it's not the music's not coming back. Like the but music, I, when I'm in America, no one like everyone is not rolling around playing grime. Like they might play someone's tune. They'll play like Dizzy Rascal, "I Love You." They like that song. You get what I'm saying? They like Novelist, uh, "One Sec." They like specific songs, but what I think's happened is life. You know what I'm saying? We always, this is what people need to remember. It's life before music. Like the music, it, the, the music is a product of the environment. It's a product of the lifestyle. You know what I'm saying? So, cause life got really real, grime came back. You know what I'm saying? Grime, you started to hear grime again cause life got really real. Like guys are really making what they want to make again. but. I don't think like it's going to be a whole like surge of like grime like blowing and shit like that. It's going to be whoever has got the correct mindset. Yeah. It's going to be whoever's like ready to get real, ready to stop the fucking faking and like say, "Yo, fam, 
we got to do this thing. we got to do this thing. If I need you to do this thing, please, we know where we're all going. Let's make this work. Yeah? Yeah, yeah. And then you go. Like, that's all it is. Like, it's not the music getting big. It's just certain people that are getting really real in life because of it's getting really real times now. They're just going to go. It's going to be like designers from London. It's going to be maybe a couple like radio presenters are going to go worldwide. A couple rappers are going to go worldwide. A few MCs are going to go worldwide. A couple producers are going to go worldwide. But it's not going to be like the scene. Everyone's like, oh, yes, it's the scene's time. No, bro. Because you still, you still retweet your whole timeline because one rapper fucking said something to you. It's embarrassing. It's embarrassing, like. That stuff there is sick. Oh, man. You never do. I mean, I've never seen you comment on, on people like I Drake. I used to. I used to. I don't want to be up here on some self-righteous shit. Like, I used to, bro. I was lost, bro. I was in a, I was in a place where I, I grew up in London. And, like, to, I was aspiring, you know, aspiring to America and, like, shit like that. Like, it's the, it, you're working with the wrong energies. You get what I'm saying? And ever since I stopped, like, that whole that whole style of like moving, I just started to prosper. People could see, people, people say, oh, Skepta's back in the scene now. And that was what I didn't do. The first, the, the main objective was to take myself out of the scene. It might look to other people that Skepta's come back to the scene. No, I removed myself completely from all those guys that are fucking retweeting up their whole fucking timeline posting their Instagram because someone tweeted them, like, someone tweeted them, oh, yeah, I like your music, bro. Like, you just, you, like, have some fucking respect for yourself, man, you know? It's not, like, just respect yourself, man, and move properly. So, just to rewind a little bit, you're, like, um, I think you're around three or four years old when you moved from, from like, old shit area to Tottenham. Did you have any sense, because I feel like Tottenham's, you know, part of who, who you are and what you become. Mm. Did you feel any sense of, like, difference like oh i'm in a different area were you too young to notice that i mean what, what yeah no i was too young i was i was way too young to notice the move but like that the, when i moved to tottenham that house was the first like my first memories of like family gatherings and like smoke outs drink outs like in the back garden speakers like dancing like tired Five in the morning, auntie's tired, <laughs> so tired, and they're still going for it. They fuck it, like they're just still just dancing in a circle, going mad. And like, I, I remember looking at it thinking, shit, man, like, I'm gonna, I, I, I want all my friends around my house one day, like yeah, yeah. dancing to my music. How important a dancehall reggae artist to, to not to just grind, but to yourself? Because it feels like we, we went to Jamaica last year with Red Bull, and we had an amazing six days exploring dancehall culture and, and sound clash culture, and obviously a lot. One of the conversations that came out at that time was that you were saying this, this is this is like right, like you could see the connection so clearly when you were there. Is that right? I mean, yeah, um, I think grime is heavily influenced by like dancehall, like just our approach to the like approach to the music. We want a reload. I need to get a reload. Like that's what it's like. And like when you watch Sting and all their shows, that's what they're emceeing for. They're emceeing for the reload. Has that, has that, does that still exist as much in Grime, the reload? That was such a massive part of the 2003 to the 2008 era, let's say. Is that still something that, that exists today? Yeah, I would say it is, yeah. Every, every show I go to, I'm trying to get a reload. When you wrote Ring Ring Pussy, your mommy's on the phone. <laughs> so sorry if my mum just is watching that. But uh, did you know that? I mean, that's, that's you, like bars like that, are you like, this is going to get a reload? <laughs> <laughs> um... No, I write the song to mash up the dance. Like, not for the reload. I want the lyric. I want, I want all my lyrics, like, when someone's in a rave, to be going fucking nuts, like, from beginning to end. But then when I'm performing it, I want the reload. You know what I'm saying? I don't, I don't, I don't make the song for the reload because it would, you'd hear me going crazy, like, on the tune. I, say, I just say my lyrics no more, just murking, doing bits and pieces, like, and just try and make people have fun. But then when I'm live on the stage... That's when I'm just, I'm really trying to, if not a reload, encore, like mad crowd cheers, like football stadium ones. What's your, what's your biggest reload at the moment? I got bare. I got bare. All right. Ooh, calm down. I have. I have. I'm joking. Go on. Give us a couple. No, no, no. But are the, are the older ones, are the older ones still uh, as vibrant as the new ones? Yeah. 
Lyrics are like wine, man. The longer that you have them, like the over time, they just get more legendary. You get me? Like all these tunes that I've made now, they get good. They get good responses, but they're not bigger than like my old bars. Like, nah, you're trying it. See, that's what I'm saying, man. I'm not trying to get you to perform. I just, just tell me, just tell me one or um, two lines. That... All of them. This go is on that, then, go on then. Yeah, everything, like everything, because I'm from the, I'm like the, from the golden era, innit? All my bars are on bare tape packs and like, like YouTube videos and shit. So this is like, people were coming to rave like now when they're 21. I was listening to them, tune, them lyrics there when they were 11. You know what I'm saying? So to them, they couldn't wait to get into rave. I see some of these kids at the front of the fucking shows going crazy. Like, so nuts. And I have to remind myself, yo, this is probably the first time this guy's come to a rave before. Like, because they got, like, it's like every year I'll go and I'll see, like, a new, like, lease of life and, like, a new energy in the, in the rave, in the shows. You know what I'm saying? Like, I'll be like, oh, yeah, I get it. Yeah, you lot are out of school now. You know what I'm saying? What, if you, if you were at, like, for example, an Eskimo dance and you had your dream liner on, your dream lineup of MCs on, what would be the one bar that you would want to hear from the one artist that would just make you go crazy? Um, it's going to have to be D-Double. I knew you were going to say D-Double. D-Double's the greatest of all time. Can we not all agree with that? But he's always... That wasn't a big, that wasn't a big year, but D-Double is the greatest MC. Like I think he's an, MC, he's an MC's MC, right? Whenever you interview any MC, they always say D-Double. Not D-Double? No, he's... Yeah, yeah, like everybody, even when I'm in America and that, like they fucking, they just fuck, they, he's like young thug. They can't understand what he's saying. <laughs> it's true. And that's another thing I learned as well. Like, see, people, Americans always try and play that, or around the world, they always try and play that. No, man, I can't really get what he's, what he's saying. But if they can feel you, they don't need to get, they don't need to understand what you're saying. When men see me MC, they know that I'm talking from a mad place. You get what I'm saying? With D E. He talks from a place of a fucking, like, just an MC. He's an MC, like, on jungle, on whatever speed it is. Like, he is, he, he bruv, DW's the greatest of all time. I don't even want to debate it. And what lyric would I want to hear of these? Jeez, what lyric? I don't know, cuz I we be watching DW freestyles every day, like, in the yard. Just keep watching DW freestyles, like, cuz all these freestyles are the sick, uh, very original. No, not okay, not very, you're talking about in a rave, yeah? Yeah, in a rave. Um, yeah, yeah, that's the one. Yeah, head get mangled. Head get mangled. Head get, get mangled. mangled. Do that normally. Head get mangled. That is probably, that's top five gram lyrics of all time. Top five? Yeah. Yeah. Head get mangled is top five gram lyrics of all time. PC people like D-Double, they're going to just, they're going to, touch wood, like when he, like long life, but when he passes away, that's when men are gonna start praising him. You know them ones like you can't ever expect people to ever speak about another human being in a in a great way while they're here because they don't want to they don't want that person to hear them talk about them like that, to big up their head and get them gassed. You know what I'm saying? But when my man's gone to the next life, um, trust me, like man was he's 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 done mental things for like UK. So um. We've listened to Snoop, like that was the person that set you on the path. Like you don't you didn't quite know quite know how it was gonna turn out, but you knew that this was something that you wanted to do yeah. artistically, you had a you had a vague vision. Tell us about tell us about <laughs> Wookie um Buck Up to me, what 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 that yeah. track how that track has inspired you and what it Yeah, no, to that you. was like man, that tune was sick, man. I remember because is it DJ Zinc did a remix of that, innit? And I went to Warehouse. I went to Warehouse, yeah. Uh where is Warehouse again? Like Edmonton ish, innit? Yeah, I went to Warehouse in Edmonton, yeah? And because someone said DJ Zinc was playing it, and I was, I was like, what? Them days to me, blood, like, them big names, I never ever thought I would see them. I was a youth, man, you get me? I've gone to Warehouse, I see Zinc in a DJ box. Yo, that was like seeing Jesus himself, because it was fucked, bro. I remember going to, I was at the front of the decks for the whole time he was on, looking up at the decks, like, yo! every tune even if I didn't know it I was playing like I knew it like I was going crazy at the front yeah and I was like yo play the remix play the remix he dropped it I went fucking nuts bro. I went crazy and then the next day I said yo I need to buy this tune and I went to uh, Scream Records in Southgate and um, <laughs> them days there you have to sing the tune to the man innit like <laughs> so I've got it like bro yo <laughs> 
And they used to try it as well. They used to know what man's singing, yeah, but they try and like not try and play that like they don't know what man's You know that tune? Oh man. And then he'd be like, oh. Then he said that they didn't have any, that they didn't have it. And then I went home and I'm, I can't remember who I was speaking to, someone from Extreme FM, and he was like, don't worry. Like, Extreme and Scream, they were like close. And he was like, don't worry, I'm going to ask them for it for you. And he got it for me. And um, I just never stopped playing it, man. I never stopped playing it. And I think just the same way as like the Snoop album was the point where I was like, I'm going to make music. I'm going to make music and make sick like shit. Like this song was when I really like fell in love with like DJ and like the whole garage, that whole garage sound. That's when I fell in love with it. That's when I was like, yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be a DJ and I'm going to do this thing. So we were in Meridian Walk in Tottenham. You're about like what, 16, ish, and you have designs to be a DJ. How did you? How did you do that? How did you like set yourself up as a DJ? Well, uh, <laughs> <laughs> we want uh, the whole story. Yeah. Oh man, fuck. I used to just do. Be Yo, I wanted this thing, you know. Like sometimes I sit here and I think it's impossible for me not to be me because I wanted I wanted this too bad. I was hungry for this thing. Like my first oh man. Yeah, so basically so <laughs> Yeah. We broke into like a sports hall, yeah. Okay. Near where I li where I lived, yeah. And like we set up uh some decks in there and I drew I I drew these I drew these flyers like I think it was like light man. <laughs> I drew these flyers, I think it was like four of them on each A4, yeah? Okay. And it was the, the whack, oh, I just wish I took a picture of it because it was the most tired flyer ever, fam, like. Was it hand-drawn? Like yeah, like hand-drawn, like okay. I tried to draw like a fucking, oh, man, shit. What did it shit. say? Like, it was just like, party, rave. Selby Center, rave, like DJ, I was DJ Machino Joe at the time. Of course. <laughs> long, it, man. long live with Machino Love Joe. It, yeah, so, yeah, I, I <laughs> DJ Machino, fucking hell. <laughs> DJ Machino Joe, yeah. And then um, a couple other guys like from the ends, that, like I put them on the flyer. And like I remember going to school telling all the girls, yo, my rave's gonna be so hard. Like, make sure you come, like this is gonna be the sickest shit that you ever go to. And then we were setting up, bearing in mind, we did this, we we did this own little mix ourselves, like in this sports hall, like two days. So two consecutive days before. We had two nice little gatherings. On the day of our actual rave, the fucking people from the, from the center, they came and locked it off, man. And I remember I was gonna cry, man. I was so upset. I told all the girls, they thought I was the fucking man. <laughs> they were like, yo, Joseph is the man. Like, this was good because of it. in school, I weren't cool. I was like, I was, I used to, oh man, my clothes were so whack. Everything, like, I was just a tired, tall, big-eared guy. You know what I'm saying? Just a bare lanky, like, not cool. So this was my cool. This was the one thing that I could say, like, yeah, like, all the girls are going to think that I'm the man for this. You get me? Then they locked it off. They locked off my party, and I ended up doing it in my, in my front room, in my living room at my house. <laughs> I, I, I moved it. I was like, yo, everyone, we're going to my house. And then, um, yeah, I set up. And my, you know, my, my mum and dad, they were for it, man. They understood what I was trying to do. They let me use it downstairs. And, um, I just, yeah, I remember that day just getting so drunk and then I missed the rest. I missed like the second half of the party because I was wasted. Your mum and dad are very supportive then, obviously. What was, what was that? You know, there's not just one performer in, in your family, there's two. There's, of mm. course, your brother, JME. Mm. Tell me a little bit about the dynamic between you two growing up. Did you ever used to hate each other when you were kids or was it always that you got on well? Was it comp comp com competitiveness between the two of you? How did you develop, like, musically as brothers and then as, as musicians on top of that? I think because me and Jamie are brothers, it would be really easy for us to just do bare tunes together, in it, and just murk and just carry on just doing songs together. But I don't think we consciously did it, but we just never make tunes together. We never really wanted to be like those brothers that just like, because you're brothers, like just make songs, you know? So the competitive side is there, but at the same time, we support each other, you get what I'm saying? And, 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 we, and we've got it in a way that whenever we do collaborate on a tune together, it's a mad thing. So, you know, we saved it. We saved the collab for That's Not Me. 
that charted. And that's and like going back to my mum and telling my mum that, like, that's sick. Like, me and my brother done a tune and it's gone in the charts, mum. Like, she's like she feels good about that. And I and I always want it to be that, man. I don't want to over like play the fact that he's my brother, because he's his own person as well. Like we're very different in ourselves. So for us to collaborate and do a song together, just like what I was talking about earlier, somewhere in our lives, we need to be like chilling together and like maybe be talking about the same thing. Like, and then, and then we can do a song together. You know what I'm saying? Like, rather than just, well, oh, yeah, man, I got a tune. I do this first on that. Didn't then we never really make tunes like that. It's really interesting as well how very different you are as MCs. Like, you're, you're completely different. What, what do you think are the things that have influenced you differently to be the people that you are? Like, what is it that's made Jamie, Jamie and Skepta, Skepta? Uh, I'm the oldest. So I think that's a start. Uh, when... I, we're both like nerdy people, innit? Like we're both like, like <laughs> I can't exp how to explain it other than do that. But we're both like, you know, like very nerdy in our ways, yeah. But I feel like living in Tottenham made me have to be a certain way. I was the oldest and I knew that we were gonna have to be around in the hood. So I, I always played like a role where I'm protecting Jamie. You know what I'm saying? Like no one ain't chatting to Jamie. Man, touch him, it's fucking on. You know what I'm saying? And I've always been like that for him. So even though he hates that, like he will get into something outside and he won't come home and tell me. Like he won't, talk, he'll tell me like six, oh yeah, remember that time? Yeah, oh yeah, I saw them mutes on the road, you know? I'd be like, what? Yeah, man, no, man, they just, they just looked at man, man, some dickhead thing and they just walked off. So that's his way of dealing with it, isn't it? He, he, to him, like someone screwing him and walking off is nothing to him. Whereas if I saw someone do that to him, I'm gonna wanna do something to them. So he's always kept that away from me and at the same time kept himself to himself. He's. Uh, I wouldn't say I, I gave him the power to be him, but I, gave, I cut that fucking rude boy shit out of his life for him to be able to be Jamie. You know what I'm saying? But with me, like, and I, and I, and I think it's affected me in a way because over time, like, I've, I've got like a stigma of like some fucking like, I don't know, like some street, like you, you know what I'm saying? When I'm, I, just, I, just, I like being on my nerdy shit, but at the same time, I understand where I'm from. I understand that I'm from Tottenham and, uh, and things go down and my position that I had to play as an older brother. So, you know, those vibes of our lives came out in the music and that's why he MCs like he does and I MC like I do. Mm. So around like 2003 when Grind came out, how, how were you and Jamie listening to it and, and like all your friends? How, did you listen, did you like go to Sidewinder? Did you listen to Deja Vu or Rinse, whatever? Did you like go to like Rhythm Division? Like how did you access Grime? How did you find out about Grime and how did you sort of gravitate um, towards it as MCs? It, as first as a producer, of course, but it was it was just school days, man. Listening to Heartless Crew and Ezen and shit. Um, yeah, we used to like. I went school uniform in my blazer. Yeah, I used to put my headphone like through the sleeve, like through there, and like pretend I'm just like working or whatever at class. And I'd be listening to tunes, like returning to work or whatever. And I and I and I was just addicted, man. I was just addicted. And then I went and I bought. I bought decks, the most tired decks ever. I just remember there was two different colors. Tired, like one of them had a belt underneath it. One of them oh, it was mental, like whack. But I made it work, you know, I made it work and we used to make tapes and this, that, this. And then uh, Wiley heard of Jamie somehow. I can't remember what it was. He heard about Jamie and he told him, oh yeah, like I've got a studio in Bermondsey, somewhere in South Jamaica Road come studio, I remember thinking, I ain't letting my brother go south on his own. Like, fuck that. So I've gone with him, gone to the studio. And we got into the studio. These times I weren't MC and I, was, I used to listen to Grime a lot, but I used to DJ in it. So and Jamie would, Jamie would, uh, Jamie was an MC. So Tinchy Stry, I remember Tinchy Strider was in there, like all the rough squad, Wiley, all these people was in there. And I've walked in, I've, I've heard of all these people and seen them on telly and but I've never seen them in real life. And he was like, Wiley was like, oh, do you want to record something? So I put my rap tune on. I was in there on some, yo, get me map 10. <laughs> I remember finishing my bar and coming at the fucking booth here and looking at everyone. Everyone was like, oh. <laughs> everyone was like, oh, mate, this guy is a bit too much. Like, he's a bit too greased. For we, wasn't ex we wasn't expecting this, you get me? And I got home that day and Wiley, he phoned me and he was like, yo, why don't you fucking, why don't you spit like some grime lyrics or whatever? And I was like, I can't do crime, that's not for me. Like I don't I don't like it. Like, I don't like how they like I never used to like like certain ways or just how people used to speak about grime MCs, like that stigma, you know what I'm saying? And then um 
I remember I was with President T, we was in the trap, yeah? And I was fucking, and I just bought an eight, this is a bit of a steep story, can I say this? No, I don't think so. Don't, I can't say it? No, you can, oh, you can't, yeah, yeah okay. you can say it, yeah. So I bought an eight ball, yeah, of fucking W, yeah? And yeah, I, I think you can. Yeah, <laughs> and, I, and, I, and, I, and I wanted to chop it up. I wanted to chop it up to bag it up, innit? So I was looking around for things in the kitchen and I saw a machete. Yeah. I don't know why I have everything in the kitchen. I saw this machete, but I saw this machete was gleaming and uh, something happened to me, bro. And I was like, go on, then draw for the machete. <laughs> and I was like, whoa. That was your very, very first bar. I was like, raw, that sounds hard. <laughs> Go on, intro for the shetty. And I was like, yeah. Then I started writing and writing and writing. And I phoned Wiley. I was like, yo, I got a lyric. I'm ready. I had one 16 bar, blood. About you're ready. Shut up. About, you know, you're ready. You got one 16 bar. But anyway, I thought I was ready. I was like, yeah, I'm ready. Went um, radio with Roll Deep. And these times, I'm going radio with like some real legends. These guys have been murking raves like Scratchy, you get me, Flo Dan. These guys have been murking raves for time. I'm going there with my 116, but it was cool because I got, I got thrown in at the deep end, didn't it? I'm like, and every week I used to go back to radio, it would give me the incentive to write more. Like, I'd be like, Yo, I ain't going back there with 116. Then I wrote, what do you mean you fool, draw for the tour? I kept writing more, 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 more. And then before you know it, you know, yeah, we just we just we were just fully involved, and that's how that's where me and Jamie's roll deep affiliation um, happened. And then and then it went back. To, then it became BBK. Yeah, um, you know what, BB boy, Be boy better know happened really like that's it's so crazy because it's probably one of the most important things in my career. But I I don't actually remember trying to make it. I don't I don't I don't I don't I don't know like how it just come about. Like Jamie was doing mixtapes at one stage with Boy Better Know on the front, and then Wiley wanted to release one, because he liked how Jamie was releasing mixtapes. He's like, yo, I want a Boy Better No mixtape as well. He made a Boy Better No mixtape or Tunnel Vision or whatever it was, and Jamie did the artwork for it. And then it was just like, us free. And then just, and then everybody else, just like, just being family just came into it, you get what I'm saying? But, yeah, it was, it, it happened really naturally, man. Because before we was Meridian, before, innit? We was we was Meridian. And blood, what, bloodline as well, or is that no, no, no? Bloodline's like that's something that happened after. But Meridian right. in in the, in the beginning of it, it was Meridian, and then um, a shooting happened in my estate, and like they, the police, one of the guys, the police found one of the guys. Uh, he was writing lyrics about oh sh fucking I'll oh, shoot this and do that and do this. So they were like, raw. Oh, so you're writing lyrics about this, yeah? Take all of Skepta's records. Like there must be there must be like lyrics on the record about shootings and shit. Like maybe we're able to find out shit. You get what I'm saying? So they took all my records and that. I'm like, I remember of, I remember moving to we we, we moved to some next house. Oh, that fucking we got evicted. Some bullshit, man. We got evicted, man, and then fucking. I remember going back to my house and like just sitting there, like, and my mum and dad, like, because they had gone to work. They had gone to work. My mum and dad went to work and they came back to no house. Like, because when the shooting happened, the police just boarded up, like, my house, and we never had a house. So my mum and dad are just in a fucking, like, a mad place, you get me? And I remember going down and thinking to myself, like, I've got, I've got to make something happen. Like, I've got to make something happen, you get me? And, like, uh, Bossy, H, President T, that man there was like still doing the road stuff. You get what I'm saying? I used to talk to, I used to talk to them about doing stuff. It would be like mm, whatever, whatever. Then I, I was like, okay, cool. When boss man comes out of jail, let's get this Meridian thing started again. Yeah. So he came out of jail, and we went to Logan show. We were, we did a sick. I think we did a sidewinder tape. You know, a Meridian Crew Sidewinder tape, it was fucking sick. I remember feeling like, wow. I used to say, um, right about now, boss man's in jail, so I'm gonna speak on Merrick's behalf. And when he came out, I was like, I had another one um, speaking on his behalf ain't needed, never saw 005 like he did. And, I, and just to have him next to me again, 
after saying free boss man all that time, having H there, Jamie there, everyone that was like, yes, like we're back, you get what I'm saying? But still, like certain people in the crew have got different agendas in it. Some people are really comfortable with being on the road. And to me, this was my way out. Like, I don't, I don't want to be on the road. Like, this is my way out of, you know, and, and so it kind of like, it kind of, through our agendas, we kind of drifted apart, you get what I'm saying? And uh, yeah, Boy Better Know just kind of stuck, man. It just kind of stuck because there was, you know, and then they made Bloodline a bit later. First of all, what is Long Song Wing Song Wing Song? I don't know, man. I just know that shit sounds fucking sick. But, um, yeah, so I, want, I, wanted, I wanted to clash him. At the time, I was murking so many men. Like, I, was, I was fucking, I did the end when I first came into the game and murked Bear Man. Then I was getting raves and murking Bear Man. And then Lord of the Mites was coming and Jammer was like, who do you want to clash? You should clash Flirt D, man. And I was like, yeah, that would be fire. But why don't we like, clash this guy in Birmingham, like it's gonna spread it. It's gonna be able to be like, people from Birmingham are gonna be able to get, have someone to support, man. It's like football, you get what I'm saying? Like, have this guy, I'm gonna clash him. So, I was, I was writing my lyrics, I remember fucking getting prepared for a clash is mentally like draining, man. You get me? I remember, I remember writing my bars every day, I'd be thinking about murking this guy. I got, I'm having fucking dreams of murking this guy. I close my eyes, I'm murking this guy, like, I just want to murk this guy. And I got to the fucking clash, and the man's first lyric is, you look like you got AIDS. <laughs> I'm thinking, what angle, do I, like, what angle do I come back, someone who's telling me that I got AIDS, bro? Like, <laughs> Because when you clash a man, you listen to what his style's about. You'd be like, yeah, if he says that, I'm going to counteract from this side. I'm going to do that. I ain't got no counteraction for AIDS. I ain't, like, I ain't got the cure for this. You get what I'm saying? I'm thinking like, yo, how, the f like, how am I, I going to do this? Like, this is a bit weird. I would be a liar to say that wasn't the hardest clash of my whole career. Like, that clash there was like, because I wasn't expecting none of it. Like, he's so unorthodox in how he spits. You get what I'm saying? Like, he comes at mad angles. Who won? I won. <laughs> Just checking. Uh, my, bars, my bars were harder than his. Like, my bars, my, bars, my bars were harder than his, yeah. But he didn't repeat a lyric, and I did. You get what I'm saying? And that's, and that's what I'll always take. I, that's what I'll always take from The Clash. Like, my, my actual bars, what I was spitting, were better than his bars. Because he comes up mad and he was calling me a Bangladeshi and like, that's not, why is everyone laughing? That's my point. That's my point. That is, that what just happened there is my point. Like, that's 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 because that's, that's, that's of where we are in England. People would laugh at someone calling me a Bangladeshi. You get what I'm saying? So I don't think that he beat me in lyrics. I beat him in lyrics, but I fucking wish I never repeated that bar because I'll be able to walk around now with like 100% saying I won, you know? Um, what other what other things would you change? Are there a couple of other points in your career that you don't feel necessarily mistakes, but that you look back and think, mm, I'd like to erase that or alter that or change that because you know, no one's perfect. What would I change? Um, I would just like to maybe believe in myself more. I can't put like I can't I can't put like a point on one on one bit because I because even when they, when I was doing stuff that I shouldn't be doing, there were still good things happening. There were still good things happening out of that, you know. So, like, I would change the fact that I didn't, like, in this country, we don't fucking celebrate people, man. Like, you get what I'm saying? Like, we don't celebrate. Anybody could do something in another country. The fuck, my whole of my Twitter time, man, I just lock my phone off. I can't bother to see all this shit. Like, they don't want to talk about anything good that's happening in this country. And I feel like because of that, I didn't have as much self-belief as I should have. I should have believed in myself. Like I should have really known that what I was doing was game-changing and innovative and like, no, like this, not anybody can just get up and do this. This is a serious thing that I'm doing. So I would have just changed the fact that I didn't believe in myself as much as I, as I should have. Like I should have really stuck by like my, my thoughts and shit. Um, Kanye and Drake, just can you tell us something interesting, funny, weird, unusual about about the sessions that you've done with those guys? Just a little insight, a little glimpse, a even if it's just a tiny little thing, just to sum up the experience of working with 
Kanye and Drake, because obviously you know, they're pretty they're pretty important people in, in culture right now. You rather? Not that I won't answer it, but like, it was a good session, man. It was a good session. Like, it was, Kanye is somebody I've always admired as an artist. And like, when I was there, like having conversations with him, like was kind of sick, yeah. you know? And like, me telling him stuff, like I'm talking to him, I'm like, yo, like, check yourself. Respect yourself for that. Believe in yourself for that. Don't be so upset about that. You get what I'm saying? And like, a man taking in what I'm saying and then he telling me certain things and I'm listening, I'm like, raw man, that's true, you know? And like, it's just, it's just, it's just, it was just a, a good exchange of like energies, man. Like the guy, the guy is very stuck in his ways. He knows how he wants things and like, it was good for me to see that. It was good for me to, it was good for me to, to see that and be like, yeah, if he can be at his level and still be like that, I'm gonna fucking take this to the neck. You get me? I'm gonna just, I'm gonna, I'm, I'm gonna, go, I'm gonna finish off where this guy left off. You know? Okay, last thing I wanna ask you is about Kanichiwa because I don't know about anybody else, but I, I, I genuinely really, really, really want to hear it. And you haven't played me any, I haven't heard anything other than what everybody else has heard. We've all heard three tracks. Can you tell us anything about Kanichiwa in terms of who you're working with, who's produced it? That just would be awesome. Um, yeah, okay, yeah. For, um, Jamie's on there. Um, Young Lord's on there. Dev Hines is on there. Blood Orange. Um, Novelist is on there. And yeah, I'm, I've just been in LA working. I really want Earl on there. And then, yeah, whatever else happens, happens, man. It's because, and like, when I felt, the way That's Not Me and all these other songs got made, because it, cause it, cause it happened so naturally and organically, yeah. I don't really, like, now I've got like eight songs, yeah. I want to put out like a 12 track album. I don't want to fucking, like, just t like make the last four to make the album, man, because to me, it's, that's not the vibe of how I made it. I really want it to be, I want it to make itself as naturally as the other songs made. That's the only reason I'm taking longer. I, I could fucking, I could put a time on it and do that, which I never will do again. I'll never say a release date, because that shit, there's fucking, it's mind troubling, like. But, um, yeah, man, I just want it to just naturally happen, man. And at the moment, like, some s people that I never, ever thought I would be working with in life are working on it with me, so... I just need to really take my time and understand that, you know, everybody telling me about my album is just like everybody else's reaction. That's, that's their lives when they wake up, when they feel they want my album, they're gonna tweet me that. You got what I'm saying? And I understand that. But at the same time, I understand what this album means to me and I just want it to be like, like I said, every song that I'm performing on stage with this album, it needs to be like, I need to beat my heart in it, yeah. you know? Um, I'm gonna ask, um, let people ask a couple of questions. Um, and maybe while we do that, perhaps you can have a think about whether or not you could maybe, is there anything you could play us from the album, do you think? Like just a little tiny little snatch, like a little teaser, a little taste. I don't know a about glimpse. that, man. I don't, I, don't, I don't even know about that. I mean, does anybody here want to hear that. it? I don't know, maybe no, maybe no yeah, one Yeah, they're going to say yeah. That's what you're supposed to say. Well, you're supposed to say yeah. I'm not gonna say no. Of course, they're supposed to say yeah, but I don't know if I want it like, nah. I'm gonna have a, like a sick listening party for my album and shit. Like I want people to, I'll, I'll, I'll invite, I know who my supporters are and people that always tweet me and shit. Like you'll be there, you know them ones, but like, I don't know about just playing a song for the sake of it. All right, well, let's get a couple of questions and maybe you'll change your mind or maybe you won't, but we'll get two questions before we finish up. Has anybody got a question? And have we got a microphone for, yeah, we've got someone just here. Is there a microphone? Uh, my question is, I think it's probably quite difficult to be an independent artist at times. What helps you to get through the difficult times? What is it that keeps you going? Um, just learning to live within my means, man. Like, because I'm like, I believe in myself so much. Like, I, one day I could have a fucking... The best day of my life, financially. Other days I'm thinking, oh shit, man, this is bullshit. I need more money or whatever. But it's just learning to live within your means, man. Like you never, 
you're never in trouble if you know how to manage your money. You get what I'm saying? Like just 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 always living within your means and knowing that this life is like it's like you can you just gotta maintain. You gotta maintain and be in a comfortable enough place to create. You get what I'm saying? I don't need to be in some massive studio. Like you can almost get that in your head, like, oh man, I wanna make a song as big as them, man. So I'm gonna be in like I need to get to like a big massive studio. Well, if you can't get to that studio, you gotta work with what you've got. And that is something that my dad taught me, like about working with what you've got, like you just make shit happen. And I see that a lot with like the newer generation, the way like guys just do pop-ups. They can't afford to, you know, rent out one of the cubicles at Box Park. So they're just gonna go and do a pop-up in the side of someone's store and hope that people on Twitter see the tweet and come and, and, and buy shit, you know? Like, it's a hustle. It's a hustle and anybody out there who, who, who you know, independent, complains about shit. Like I just, this is shit and money management, I think. Just learn money management, like really learn to live within your means, like stretch that 10 pounds, you know what I'm saying? Learn to like buy the noodles, buy noodles if you've only got a tenner, cause you know that it needs to, yeah man, fuck it. Like buy the noodles and know that that's what you're gonna eat till Saturday until you get your next peas or whatever and just, and just work like that. As long as you're comfortable enough to create, like you just need to be comfortable enough to create and that's it. We get another question. Also, oh, just quickly, while we're looking for that person, why haven't you signed yet, Skeptory? I mean, presumably you've had offers. Are you, are you determined to stay independent? You, can you see yourself signing in the future? Uh, yeah, I want to. I, yeah, I want to. I want to sign, but it's just got to be the right deal, man. Like I said, I'm a big man now. Like I don't like. I ain't trying to be in a fucking free album deal at my like at my age. What am I gonna do that for? Like and just be like in someone else's. Regime. I want. I want. I want something where uh, you know, like where. Oh, well, we're gonna get it. It's nice deals on the table right now. I can't even front. I can't even front. I ain't gonna lie. But what? But the, the, like, there's sick. <laughs> that's the money. There he is. That's making them stamp. <laughs> but um. Yeah. You know. I. I've been waiting for this moment. Like, Pete. This whole like last two years is all about positioning myself, putting myself in a place where man no Skepta is going to do this regardless. I don't care who don't like it. I swear I don't I swear I don't care. I'm f I don't give a shit, bruv. If you don't like it, that's your business. I'm gonna carry on doing this and and it's gonna get to a stage where people in the industry can't ignore me because I'm gonna be like taking food off all of their plates. You get what I'm saying? Yeah, you turn around for a second, I will snatch that falafel from you. get me? <laughs> Big man ting, and, 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 we're, and we're gonna keep doing it, and we're gonna keep doing it, and to the point like now, they're like, yo man, every radio fucking DJ is coming back to Radio One and saying, yo, I've been in America, and they're playing Skepta. What are we playing now? Someone's coming from another country, Japan. Oh yeah, they're fucking with Skepta in Japan. Yo, what are we playing? How many times are you going to go back to Radio 1 and everyone's going to say, yo, they're playing Skepta, bro. Like, we've got a playlist something. Now nah, they're playlisting, man, doing, us, doing all stuff, trying to support, man, and all that. And I'm just like, thank you. You get me? Thank you. But at the same time, I know that I did this. You know, I did this. So now that we're here, the right, the right deal, not for me, not for Skepta. Because I'm a big, this ain't even about me, like. I'm one of them people that I'm just gonna be, this, this is more important. Me sitting here talking to people about, you know, the struggles that I've been through is much more important than my music now, today. You know, I just make music because I can make music. But if this is all about making something so all the new generation never ever have to go through what we went through. You know what I'm saying? Because there's no, there's no, there's no structures or things set in place for people to just do what they want. You know, like Jay-Z and them guys, they realized at one point that we need to make these record labels so that if we want to sign someone, we can do the right video. Labels in this country are trying to sign me and be like, yeah, you know, you know, we just, we, we just fucking, look what we did for Oli Murs. <laughs> come on, man. Come on, Skepta. Yeah, you know what I'm saying? So I come to you now and I sign to you. You're trying to get me the same video guy that did Oli Merz's video, the same press people that did Oli Merz's video, because that worked for Oli Merz. That's not my settings. You get what I'm saying? I'm, I've got different settings to him, and it's all about big businesses and companies and, and, and fucking organizations like ourselves that understand 
like the artist so that when I see something in you, I'm like, yo, I know what you need. You need to be driving down your block in the fucking Mercedes G-Wagon, yeah? With the fucking, with the North Face thing, stand up there, flash out the chaps out of the sunroof. You get what I'm saying? Like, I, I, I know, I, I, I know what's going on. So we just need more people at the top who know how to market and push out our shit. Because the, the more that things keep getting big and then we just keep going to their same fucking modules and it's like, they don't know what to do with us, man. They're just killing artists daily, like killing sick artists like that have got, you know, originality. You're just making them some generic fucking Jason Derulo rapper, bro. You know? And that's what we're doing. We're just setting up the deal that we're looking for is a proper deal so that when people come through, we say, look, fam, I ain't trying to fucking eat off no one, but take this make this video, put that there, do the right shows, open up for him, you're gonna do that show, you're gonna support him, and it'll be, it'll be proper, like, that's all I, that's all I wanna do now, cause this shit, like, it's not about me like that, really. I think that feels like a good place to end it, on a high. Yeah? Thank you very much to, to Red Bull Music Academy, thank you very, very much to Skepta. Thanks for coming thank down. You. I'll play, uh... Yo. And I just want to say, yeah, I just want to say, like, it's kind of fucking, it's easy, it's easy for, like, to look at and be like, yeah, but you're Skepta, though. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's going to get, oh, you're Skepta, though. Everything I say is like, oh, yeah, but you're Skepta. And I want everyone to know that one, at one day, one stage, like, no one didn't know of me. And my only, the only thing in my mind was I wanted to do something. You get what I'm saying? It all starts from it all starts from that small idea. You want to do something, but you don't know the people around you to make it work. And you and and and, and you consider failure before you've even tried. You get what I'm saying? You need to like. Has anyone seen that 25 minute underdog psychosis video that I did online? A couple of people. Like, that was just like that is basically what I'm trying to say. Just really, when you think of something, understand that if you can think it. Most things, anyway. If you can think it, you can make it materialize. Like, as soon as it's a thought in your head, get the right people around you. Don't get no people who's going to be like, mm, I don't know, I don't know, I'm not really... No, fuck off, bro. I don't want to talk to you no more. You get what I'm saying? I don't want to talk to you because you're just chatting shit. Like, uh, align yourself with people that make shit work. Like, you want it to work, it has to work. And if you ain't got the mean, if you ain't got things to make it work in the, as, on a bigger scale as you would like it to, do the smaller scale and you build and you build and you build. Use your Twitters, use your Instagram, use all the fucking social networks and just and just promote your promote your shit, bro, and stay original, be original, be individual. Cause I know like in the hood, there's that settings in it like, man can't wear them crepes. That's how it starts. Oh man can't hold girls' hands. Fuck them man there. Uh nah, you can't wear your hat like that. Ah oh, nah, you can't draw them girls. And over years, it kind of beats you into being exactly the same as everyone else. You know what I'm saying? You've just got a crew of people now that have beat themselves into this stereotype. And you, now you're not yourself. You know what I'm saying? You're just thinking like with everybody else. It happens in the scene as well. People want to be in the scene. Like, fuck the scene. The scene is something that, I don't know, made by one extra or something. Whoever they playlist, we have to have to accept them in the game. Fuck the scene. You, as a person are individual, yeah? And promote your shit and believe in your shit. And when you want to do something, set the goal and do not stop until you get there. And I promise you, you will start to, because once you, once you set one goal and you do it, you get powerful. Like I feel, I feel mad right now. Like I feel like anything I want to do, I'm going to do it. It's scary it almost. Like I feel like, it, like a bit. Superman or Batman. Yeah, or yeah, no, I swear down. Like, I'll be thinking of shit, thinking, yo, that, that can happen, you know? Like, and, and like, I, I'm, uh, my thoughts, I need to slow down because I, I, I'll go, that's why I need to smoke. <laughs> that's a stupid excuse, isn't it? But yeah, I need, I need to slow my thoughts down because I almost become too, like, productive in my mind faster than I can physically do, you know what I'm saying? So, yeah, once you reach one goal, you'll be like, yeah, that felt good. And you'll do the next one, you do the next one, you do the next one, and you just become unstoppable, man. And people will start talking you, talking about you like you've fucking you've done something that they can't do. It all, it's all about 
not being scared to be individual. At first, people are going to say, I don't know, you're shit, you've fallen off. Then they're going to say, oh, you're weird or whatever. You're, I don't know, you're different, you're a hipster or whatever. And then they're going to go and say, nah, but my man's on his own thing, you know. He's on his own thing, trust me. He might not fuck with him, but he's on a different thing. Then after that, the next step is, my man is hard. So you need to be ready to go through those stages. You know what I'm saying? Be prepared to go to rock bottom and start. Be individual. Stay, stick to your thing and understand people are going to diss you. People are going to chat shit and not understand it. But that's exactly what you want. You don't want people to understand it. You want them to not know how the fuck you're making this work. And you carry on and you fucking be great. Everybody in this room, be great. <laughs>